This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to the Unstoppable Indians. Every week we take a journey into the life of an outstanding Indian, a person whose talent, acumen or moral example is transforming India. The best, the finest from every field join me, Mandi Dhillon, on this show to share their life story, their journey to success, some of the knocks along the way, what made them get up and keep going, what makes them an unstoppable Indian. My guest today is the astrophysicist Srinivas R. Kulkarni. He is Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Science at Caltech and Director of the Caltech Optical Observatories. He's among a handful of Indian scientists on whom the hopes of a Nobel rest. Professor Kulkarni, thank you very much for joining me on The Unstoppable Indians. It's a pleasure and it's a rare opportunity to meet you here in India, in Bangalore. To a lay person, how would you describe your life's work? First of all, it's the best kind of work because uh, I get paid to do what I like. Uh, and what I do is basically um, study things that happen in the heavens. Uh, and in the last uh, decade or so, I've been focusing on uh, how stars die and the search for extrasolar planets, both which are very um, interesting as well as very uh, lively topics now. What, in your own assessment, would be the most meaningful of your body of work to you? This is to you, no external assessment. There are two ways to look at astronomy, and I enjoy both kinds. The one is a uh, pure phenomena. It's, uh, there's a very rich universe out there. It's very, very rich, actually. And it's uh, going and discovering them. And uh, whenever, whenever you discover something that you know for the first time, you realize you discovered. It's a great, great, great feeling. Um, and in that aspect, for example, um, I'd like to think that I can contribute some handsomely to the field of extrasolar planets uh, and I'm involved in a big mission which hopefully it will fly one of these days uh, will have the sensitivity to detect an earth mass planet in, in around a sun-like star. Uh, I think that would be to me a major personal achievement as well as a cultural achievement. And does it feel within grasp? I think so. <laughs> uh, we have we conceived this program actually almost now uh, 15 years ago and uh, we hope uh, this mission will, will go up in five to eight years from now. And I think, yeah, I think it's within grasp. I think it's also within grasp, not with this mission, but within my lifetime and certainly your lifetime that astronomers will be able to look at these planets and say, well, you know, this has oxygen. Uh, that would be very interesting. I'm sure you'd agree, and any person on the street would agree that would be very interesting. It, it indeed would. But is there one question in your field that doesn't feel within grasp and it sort of haunts you that you must find the answer to? Probably 20 years ago, most people would have believed that. But the development in technology has been so great. It's been so great uh, that I would say this is not only a question of a national determination because these are very expensive projects, make no mistake on that. But it is within our technical grasp and whether it is within our fiscal grasp, I don't know. But uh, uh, what I, my prediction, I think these are all uh, very reasonable at this point. Our expectations are, are very reasonable. Does it embarrass you when I have an introduction like the hopes of the Nobel uh, rest on you, or does that not figure in your scheme of uh, life? Well, first of all, it doesn't embarrass me because I don't think it's true, so you know, there's nothing to be too embarrassed. Um, honestly, when I was a younger person, things of that sort really, you know, were in my mind, but I don't know exactly when, maybe when I became 40 or something. Uh, at some point, uh, maybe I, I could even use the word, I grew, I grew out of it, you know, you don't, uh, and partly 
because I've been extremely lucky. I, uh, not one of these scientists who had lots of difficulties along the way. I've been extremely lucky in finding many new things. Um, and I've been amply rewarded uh, by almost anything that anyone could aspire in my field, I feel I've, I've obtained. So, uh, uh, therefore, I won't be embarrassed. <laughs> I want to rewind to your childhood, to your growing up years. Yeah. What were they like? Because I'm looking for the first sparks of science entering your life. Um, I grew up in Hubli, which in those days was a small provincial town. It, it is now a very large provincial town. So I didn't have the, the same kind of exposure that, uh, let's say, a child would have in a, a metropolis like Delhi or Bombay, which have more opportunities and uh, in a way that was fine because there's more time that went into preparing myself in more you know more basic things um, and I was always interested in in, in science uh, but it wasn't anything too dramatic it was a, a gradual interest and more than that I think I knew what I was not interested in, and a lot of those things became more definite as I as I grew up and then uh, going into astronomy to me was, uh, was a big surprise. I, I had no preconception that's what I'd do. So how did astronomy figure? Well, it looked interesting. It's not I didn't know much about astronomy. As you know, um, astronomy is not taught in schools uh, yes. in a major way. I mean, uh, perhaps not, not in a minor way, um, uh, which I hope will not remain the case. But nonetheless, it is not. it wasn't taught when I was growing up. I still think it's the case. And I knew much something about it, uh, but I went to IIT Delhi to do what I think is called as engineering physics, and I thought I'd work on maybe semiconductor physics or devices, lasers, that sort of stuff. And then I went to a summer school uh, as one of these uh, national talent uh, scholarship, uh, and it was to an astronomy place. And the reason I chose that is the previous year, I had gone to a summer school in Pilani, Bits. And I said, you know, next summer it has to be much cooler. And this summer school was in Bangalore. And it was just astronomy, I said. And I, when I went there, I thought, this is, more, this is more fun than what I thought I was doing. So uh, paradoxically, it was, I thought it was much easier than other things I had in mind. The U.S. chapter, when did that, when and how did that kick off? I want to. Uh, I went to this summer school, which was at the Raman Research Institute here in Bangalore, and um, I actually wanted to do my PhD here with uh, one professor Nityananda, and he uh, advised. And I think that's because probably I was not as good a theorist as probably he thought one should be to stay in India. He said maybe you should go and be an experimentalist, and he advised that I should go to the U.S. Uh, so I applied only to about two or three schools, none of these, you know, long number of backups and backups or something, and uh, I got ad uh, admitted to Berkeley and MIT, and uh, Berkeley gave me admission, uh, uh, gave me a scholarship, and MIT didn't, so the choice was very simple. Do you think that it's almost inevitable that in science, those who are committed to it, to yeah. fundamental science, will find their way overseas because just the, the teaching environment, the research opportunities are far greater than India or am I being too critical about the Indian conditions? It's different in different fields. I think the larger fields, uh, I'm told, uh, uh, like bio and biotechnology related fields, there's sufficient uh, uh, critical mass here and there's uh, also industrial connections. Probably it's also true in physics. Uh, but the smaller fields, naturally, the, a larger country with a more vibrant uh, uh, program is always uh, enticing. Uh, however, I am trying to uh, contribute something uh, in reverse now is I'm trying to set up some programs within my own institutions and astronomical institutions here in a way to give the best of both worlds, or at least to give two worlds, which is to get students enrolled here. They do their PhD. They are in the PhD program here. They do their um, coursework and find an advisor. And then 
part of this program would be then they could come and utilize the instruments in, 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 in at Caltech or in the West uh, and get exposed a bit. And uh, I th hope uh, I can succeed. I've been trying for some time and it's been taking a bit longer than I had in mind. In your professional journey, um, Caltech seems to be the resting place now or is that too early to say? Uh. Oh, I'm pretty much a fixture at Caltech. After fin finishing my PhD in Berkeley, I went to Caltech and I've been there oh, enough for 23 years. Uh, it's, I think, in the field I'm in, mean, it's perhaps the best place in the world. Uh, so pretty much, uh, hopefully uh, the word resting place doesn't mean I'm no longer active, but <laughs> yes, no, it's a fun place. I take uh, resting place back because it does indeed have a connotation of not being active, and I didn't right. mean that at all. As you look around the Caltech campus, do you see more Indians, uh, particularly in your space of work? Not particularly. I would say that, uh, and uh, one should probably look into these figures, but there are far more Indians, I believe, when I was a student doing sciences uh, that I'm talking of in the late 70s and early 80s, and there are many Indians now in, 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 in the U.S. campuses. I do believe India sends the largest number of students to the U.S., or maybe the second, I don't know. But I think it's largely uh, in uh, masters or more prof or courses that lead mainly, you know, people who have aspirations to go into industry, MBA, and even undergraduates. Uh, but perhaps the number of Indians doing research uh, or PhD program, I. My impression is, at best, remained constant, perhaps even decreased.